Hello everyone, what is up? I am Rob. And I'm Tim. And this is another episode of Monster Fuzzy Familiars. <laughs> um, another uh, another aimless fuzz. Another aimless fuzz, yeah. I, I've put out the word, maybe you're not familiar with this, uh, the term turkey teeth. Are you familiar was, with this term? I was afraid to ask. <laughs> yeah. So basically, there's, I'm going to explain it to you, and maybe we have some blowing listeners as a result of you being on here. I'll, I'll explain the lore of turkey teeth. So basically, in Ireland and indeed the UK and a lot of Europe, um, and in America, dental dental stuff is expensive, right? Oh yeah. Right. So a lot of people, what they do is they fly on a plane and go down to Turkey to get uh-huh. their teeth done, right? Uh-huh. They also go and get their hairlines done down there because they do the hair implants. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people call it Turkish hairlines when you fly down to <laughs> down to. Turkey, but apparently these flights from like Dublin to like Turkey are just full of like balding men, men with bad teeth, all this shit. <laughs> but uh, so the joke is, Eamon is in, he's not in Turkey. He's in, uh, I think he's in, maybe he's in the Canary Islands. I'm not sure where he is exactly. Portugal, maybe. But he is getting dental work done there. So the joke is that he's getting t- um, turkey teeth, basically, when he's not. <laughs> but yeah, Irish dentists will not touch you if you get turkey teeth. They're like, nope. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you if you come back with a mouthful of party whites, they're like, nope, we're not dealing with you. If you want dental treatment, back to turkey. So it's a wow. whole EU phenomena kind of thing. I wonder, does the States have it with Mexico with certain things? Like, I wonder, do some people... People definitely the- go down there for... Uh- for for certain procedures for sure yeah yeah so yeah. similar yeah kind of same thing uh, how are you doing tim by the way i'm all right you doing good mm. yeah yeah we've got a funny one today it's um a ritual uh it was prompted by one of our listeners gerald who who wrote in for last week's episode and basically they were asking about the three kings ritual and what we thought of it um neither one of us had heard of it right then no i i, I maybe i might have heard the name but mm. i didn't know anything about it. and so i don't think we've ever done a ritual on the podcast i don't think we've ever done an episode about rituals even i don't think so this is a first so i thought this would actually fit tim quite well because maybe tim once we actually get through it there might be some stuff that you're like oh yeah maybe a part of something like that or you know because like it's definitely it's definitely in our wheelhouse in a sense. Uh, I, did, but, I did my years in the occult. I, yeah, I did, I, I did my time with that stuff. So we'll see. Did you practice or did you just kind of curiously read? Oh no, I was uh, I was uh, yeah, I was in Kenneth Grant's OTO for oh, a cool. time. I was uh, part of the whole eighties uh, back in the eighties, the eighties chaos magic thing before it became like you know cool Wicked. guys on the internet with leather pants and shaved heads <laughs> or like like associated with a lot with like uh, like anarcho punk stuff a lot of the anarcho yeah. punk kids were also into into like the chaos magic yeah my dad was so that's like i grew up with an altar in my bedroom that my dad used uh well actually he had to move the altar when i think my brother was born um and he practiced yeah black magic Big oh, into wow. yeah, big big into Crowley or Crowley. I would say Crowley is how I'd pronounce it, but big into Alistair Crowley. Um, has a legitimately insane collection of his books. Probably one of the best in Ireland, I'd say. Um, and yeah, he was he was what you would call a practitioner. And I, as a kid, probably eleven or twelve, I remember me and one of my friends. We were in his bedroom and we found uh one of his uh notebooks. And it was sort of a leather notebook with the pentagram on the front. He had drawn, hand drawn it. He was all he was very much into all of that. So we read through it, you know. And um, yeah, all the rituals and stuff were in there. Uh, all the sort of some of the elemental magic kind of rituals and all this kind of stuff. Uh, to us at the time, you know, 11 or 12, we got a laugh out of it. But obviously, we've talked about in mini fuzz there last week. Uh, as you get older and you sort of kind of, I suppose, you experience all these different things, you hear these different stories and you're like, oh, yeah, OK, right. Maybe there's a bit more to it than what you think at face value. But yeah, so long story short, rituals and all that stuff, Um, I do have a little bit of experience with. But funnily enough, I did actually before today, I actually mentioned this ritual to my dad. He didn't have a, a notion about it. He had never heard of it either. 
Um, now, does he does he still practice or? Uh, yeah, but I think he's kind of more. I would say a kind of pagany now. He's kind of, um, but he is a. He'll kill me for not remembering any of this, but he's like an ordained kind of. Is ordained even the right word for those witches? I don't know, but he's. <laughs> so basically, there's a place in Wexford called, and it's not. It's called the Temple of Isis, but it's not like Isis. It's the Egyptian Isis, mm-hmm. um, and that's in Clonigal. It's a big castle there, and they all practice there. And uh, yeah, my dad was definitely a part of that. Um, I think most of his practice and he did on his own though. But yeah, like as a kid, I was like, I went down and they were all doing the ritual one time in the basement. I was like, what's this weirdo? What's all this weirdo shit? So I was like 13 or 14. <laughs> and uh, I've been present at rituals. I've been, I've been, um, there was another girl, bless her. She, I think, she, I think it was suicide and she, and she passed and she was part of that community. But they did a big ritual for her in the woods. Mm. So I was actually present for that, to be fair. I was there for that. And I never was involved. But mm-hmm. yeah, I've been involved, like been around all that stuff for sure. So uh, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. But yeah, my dad very much involved. So any of that kind of magic-y stuff. Um, I always found it interesting. I found Alistair Crowley interesting, I suppose, when I was young. Did you read any of his stuff, Tim? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> interesting character, right? Even just from a sort yeah. of a biographical standpoint yeah i always uh found him very interesting i was uh i was more of an austin spare guy i don't know if you know he was he was an artist yeah the name's familiar kind of kind of the founder of of modern chaos magic uh Mm -hmm. uh, you know and uh he was sort of a in the side of of crowley's universe you know he was a sort of a a uh the crowley tried to bring him into the oto and and uh he found that uh spare was uh not having it. Right. Well, he wanted to do his own thing, was it? I think he didn't want to have sex with Crowley. As well. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't blame him, to be fair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, Crowley <laughs> called him a black ma- magician after that. But uh, yeah, Spare was, uh, he was, he was my guy. I think it was because of the art thing. You know, he was like uh... such a great artist. So I kind of connected on that. Um, am I right in saying, do you ever hear this WB Yates through Alistair Crowley down the stairs? I don't know if I heard that or not, but I, yeah. I know he was involved in all that. That's, yeah, yeah. That's, that's yeah, apparently, yeah, apparently there's a there's a story of uh, WBH strong crawly down the stairs for whatever reason. I can't remember why. Break but, these uh, my ass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <That was definitely good. laughs> yeah. yeah, but uh, yeah, we will actually, uh, Monster Fuzz will do a crawly crawly episode at some point in time. We were actually up near Beleskin House uh for the the hike the Loch Ness meetup um mm-hmm. we're very close to his place so yeah we'll definitely will in the future um we, before we get into this episode though folks I'd like to remind everyone to check out our Patreon uh you'll get your ad free episodes over there you'll get your exclusive episodes and all of that jazz as well as access to the Discord you can pay yearly if you like you'll get the two months for free also a quick reminder if you have any spooky stories maybe you've done this ritual maybe you've maybe you're into this kind of magic uh, write in monsterfuzzpodcast at gmail.com we'd love to hear from you always interested to hear stories of those rituals actually because I've read some of Crowley's rituals and they're just mad like some of the stories that some of his ritual accounts and things that happened in them you're like if even half of this is true this is nuts yeah, you know? oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I have like, friends that, that are pretty heavily into it and some of the things they report are just wild like just it's wild stuff happening like you know stuff going off around them while, while they're doing these rituals and so forth stuff that sounds like um hallucinations but it's real life right it's like stuff that sounds almost so fantastical that you're like oh i can't believe that but to them it's like no that happened that was a yeah. thing so you're like okay right i'll just take yeah. you at face value i mean i'm who am i to, to question yeah um but brief intro here just a little quick one uh what actually is this ritual so basically, yeah, it's uh, the Three Kings ritual, and it is a modern occult practice that emerged online, especially popular on Reddit, yep, and is intended to be a way to explore deeper psychological or metaphysical aspects of reality. Metaphysical Bigfoot Tim might pop out in one of these rituals, <laughs> perhaps. Who knows? Um, and it's often referred to as a game, but it is generally regarded with caution due to its eerie and unsettling nature. It was a Reddit user by the name of Fable Forge, who I believe made the first post about it. Um, that was just what I had come across when I was doing these nuts yesterday. 
Um, but for people that want to know, what we're going to do here is we're going to tell you how to play the game first. And uh, then we'll get into some anecdotes. And we'll also, just as we're going through this here, we'll kind of weigh in a little bit on what we think as yeah. we go. Because, yeah, me and Tim aren't familiar with it. So, interesting. So, here's the post. I have been posting bits and pieces of my life here on this forum, but I find them a little boring and self-serving. So today I'll post a recipe instead. This is not creepy pasta, at least not yet. And I'm writing it from a train in the NYC area. What I'm about to share with you today is one of many relatively safe ways in which you can access, not quite enter, a place I call the shadow side. And its effectiveness depends on how seriously you take me. Your mileage may vary. Refer to the title. Is that is that part of it? That was part of the thing, Tim, that I got from Magic was like almost if you didn't believe in it, there was no energy going to come from it. Like, I I mean, honestly, I think there's an element of that with the paranormal, too. You do get people who and these are the people who often have these really terrifying, life shaking kind of experiences Mm -hmm. because they they were just not in any way ready for it they didn't believe in whatever it was you know ufos bigfoot whatever it was Mm -hmm. they didn't in any way they didn't think it could ever happen and it happens to them and it kind of shakes their world to the foundations but uh if like if someone told me like you know hey take me out and then take me to one of these places you have paranormal experiences but i'm i'm not open to it i think it's all bs Mm -hmm. you know I'm not talking about being generally skeptical. Like mm-hmm. the first time John came with me to, to the place where we see lights, he's like, take me out there. I'll tell you what it was. And I'm like, okay, come on out. Like I'm, I'm fearless. If you can explain it, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm down for that. And he went out there and he's like, Oh no, I, I don't know what these are. <laughs> you know? oh, okay. I have no clue what these are. So I'm not talking about being generally skeptical, but if you're just hard, like, no, mm-hmm. this is all BS. It's probably not going to work. Like yeah. it's probably, you're probably going to kill it just with that energy. Uh, probably works the same with the occult, I would think. If you just are are, are dead sure it's not going to work, then probably not. One thing I will say at these rituals that I've been present at, there's definitely an energy that's created. Now, if if from my perspective, maybe it is just the energy of a bunch of humans gathering and chanting and kind of doing their thing, right? But still, I mean, even that alone is probably bestowing those people with something and of course, then if they're believing in it, then yeah, there's more. And obviously I'm viewing it from kind of a, I'm trying to view it from like a more sort of uh, rational, maybe skeptical slash kind of standpoint, I suppose, just to kind of offer the kind of um, contrarian take on it, you know? Um, but yeah, it's interesting. Like, look, we'll get, we'll get into more of it here. They said, uh, I won't tell you that you shouldn't be afraid of the shadow side. Chances are you've already seen it after all. I merely think it was just a recurring dream. Now, well, we've had them. We just talked about them last week on Minifuzz. Mm -hmm. I will tell you there is no need to be ignorantly afraid of it, though. There is a difference. Ignorance fuels fear, and fear can give that place a lot of juice to run on. You have to be big on preparation if you want to try this. It's like skydiving. If getting it right on your first try is not something you're good at, then this is not for you. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting that he's saying ignorance fuels fear and fear can give this place a lot of juice to run on. That's, I mean, I've had many people suggest that, that what these different entities want, these different paranormal entities want is a fear reaction from us. So it's interesting. It is. Yeah. It's funny, isn't it? When you get the fear as well, again, just at at face value, like, have you ever, I'm, I'm sure you have, of course, that's a silly question. Um, when you're out on your own walking somewhere and you get a bad sense and the fear just overwhelms you. It's crazy sensation, right? Had it last week. Did you? It, yeah. Oh, where yeah, were you? I, I, I pushed through it. I just yeah. was like, I was like, I don't know whether I'm about to encounter a bear or what's going to happen here, but I'm not like, and usually I will turn around. Usually I will uh-huh. like completely listen to that feeling. And I was just being hard headed. I was uh-huh. just like, nah, I don't uh-huh. care. Whatever it is, I'm going to face it down today. And nothing happened. I was fine, but I did have that feeling. It was intense. It was really intense. Me and Eamon got it one time. We were watching. Um, there was an old website called like JK Cinema. I think was the name of it. And they had these like this was like probably like eighteen years ago now, I suppose. And um, they had these like 
really bad clips of like kind of I suppose early what you would call creepy pasta. Really, mm -hmm. it was like like the prototype for that kind I of thing. I think I remember that. I yeah, remember that. Like, like stuff where people like late at night and somebody ghost be videos see something behind them or something. Yeah, yeah. And like here's like uh, it did have like a parking lot CCTV ghost mm -hmm. footage, yeah. all this kind of stuff, and um. We watched a bunch of that and then we had to walk home and yeah, we, we both totally just irrationally were overcome with this kind of like, oh, we have to get out there. Well, maybe it wasn't irrational, who knows, but we were definitely entertaining stuff that night. Um, But to go on to say, this is another interesting little tidbit. If you do drugs or alcohol the night of the event, you're going to have a bad time. If you're going through some serious issues in your life and not feeling mentally or spiritually stable, or if you're doing this just to escape, you're going to have a bad time. And if you don't follow my instructions, particularly the multiple backups I'll give you, which, trust me, are there for a reason, you're going to have a bad time. Mm. Yeah, I think that Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Because anything kind of... um. Uh, hallucinogenic they say the same thing right if you're I was thinking, I was thinking the exact same thing it's yeah like, yeah don't don't use it as a party drug and yeah don't go into it if you're it's like set and setting like if you're not in a good place mentally or physically don't do it and the don't. shame the shame about it is a lot of the people that gravitate towards um hallucinogenics are the exact people who shouldn't take them yep because they're looking for something, right? They're trying to, they're, they're seeking, which they're saying in this ritual too, is the same thing as like, if you're seeking something, don't do it. Like, don't do it to try and answer things or anything like that. Um, Like I, I know personally people who have taken hallucinogenics and stuff and never come back right, you know? Um, oh, yeah. And it could just, yeah, like it can, it can unlock something in you, mm -hmm. um, especially if you do it at the wrong ages. But yeah, so... The game is the three kings. There's ingredients. Um, so the ingredients are a very large, empty, and quiet room, preferably without windows. So if windows exist, you need to cover them to ensure total darkness. Basements work well uh, in this case. A pack of candles. You'll only use one if all goes well. And a lighter. You need a bucket of water and a mug. You need a fan. You need two large mirrors, like the one on your dresser. Don't worry, they won't be harmed. Or if they are... It'd be the least of your concerns. I like that little mm. caveat there. Three chairs, an alarm clock, uh, not an alarm clock, but an alarm clock, an active cell phone, uh, make sure the battery's charged, a loved one willing to follow the rules and go along with all this madness, a small toy or dear object from your childhood. And here is the setup. So for the setup, well, is there anything there from that that you, I mean, the mirrors are sort of a, paranormal kind yeah. of thing right they show yeah. up in a lot of stories yeah yeah i'm trying to remember there's a there's a a thing about sitting in in a in a dark room with mirrors it's like mm -hmm. a whole like a little paranormal ritual mm -hmm. i'm trying to remember it psychomantium is uh, it psychomantium i think it's called um, yeah have so, you heard of it any of you have any cases about anything i've had people talk about doing it yeah um but um you know i I can't recall, but you know specifics mm. of it. But I know it's it's definitely a thing that people talk about doing. I think it's it might involve two mirrors as well. I'm trying mm. to remember, I'm trying mm. to remember exactly how it went. Might I might check your memory here as well. So start to set up at 11 p.m. Place one chair in the center of the room facing north. This is important. Place the other two chairs exactly to the left and the right facing your throne. So your your seat in the middle is the throne. The distance between your throne and that of your queen and fool should be about the length of your arm to each side, more or less. Place the two large mirrors on the queen and fool chairs left and right of you, facing you and each other. Try your best to have them stand at a 90 degree angle or else you may get more or less than three kings. If you sit on your throne facing straight ahead north, you should be able to perceive your own reflection in each of the two mirrors without actually having to turn your head nor your eyes to do so. If you see your own reflection in the corner of your eye, just barely there, then you've done it right. Place a bucket of water and the mug in front of you, just barely out of reach. Place the fan behind you, turn it on. Don't set it to maximum, medium or low is fine. Leave it on. Turn off the lights, leave the door open and go to your bedroom. This is an interesting so set the candles by the side of your bed next to your lighter, your alarm clock and your cell phone. 
set your alarm clock for 3.30 a.m. That sound familiar to him? That's demonic spooky hour, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, when I first read Mothman Prophecies, the book, mm -hmm. uh, I started waking up every morning. I believe it was 3.30 a.m. Mm -hmm. And then I passed the book to Allison and she read it and she started waking up oh, wow. every morning at 3.30 a.m. And we gave it to one of our friends and they read it and they said, and we said, look, we keep waking up every, you know, and they started waking up every morning. I think it was 3.30 a.m. It was right around that time. Mothman Prophecies, that's the film as well, yeah? Yeah. yeah. I've never seen it. I've never seen it. Uh, film's an okay film, but it's, it gives you nothing that the book gives you. Like the, the, the sense of paranoia and and uh, sort of paranormal oppression that yeah. Keel felt during all that is is uh, much heavier, I think, in the book. Who wrote it? John Keel. John Keel. And is it fictional? No, it's just true. Oh, okay. This is interesting. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's his experiences at, around Point Pleasant, West Virginia, right. in Ohio, during the time of that Mothman flap in the 60s. Oh, I see, because I knew that it was adjacent to Mothman and, and, and all of that stuff, but I wasn't sure how tied into it it actually was. Yeah, no, um, it's, it's, it's super interesting. I mean, there's men in black and there's, you know, weird phone calls that are predicting things that happen in the future and just all of this craziness that, that's happening, including people waking up and seeing uh flannel man oh maybe that's me you know maybe, <laughs> I'm, maybe i'm showing up annoying people at 3 30 um yeah that that's that's the time is that when you upload your episodes is around now? <laughs> it depends it's whenever i get them done but usually uh, it ends up being about 3 30 a.m yeah no because i thought because i schedule mine so i was thinking like when i wake up i see that yours are usually out which would mean that yeah usually it would be about you know, six hours before or whatever. And I'm like, is that coming out at 3.30 or 3 a.m.? So here's the sad truth. I'm usually slamming it together in a in a panic <laughs> on, on Wednesday night. And uh, very few times do I get it done before midnight. So it, whenever I get it done and uploaded is when, it, when it's out. So I'm usually like in a panic last minute, like editing and doing everything and getting it ready. See, you shouldn't have told anyone and been like, yeah, that's demonic, which now we're a strange familiar's <laughs> baby. That's, the way, that's what we draw. It's, it's just a bad time management issue. <laughs> yeah, I'm lucky. Like I just have usually a day where I'm like, well, you see, now that we have the video and we have two episodes dropping per week, I've literally only got like two days to have the video and the audio done. So mm -hmm. usually what I'll do is I'll do both episodes in a block together. And then that way, yeah, I can schedule them and actually be organized, which is not like me, but um, mm -hmm. just how the workflow works. But um, they're saying, yeah, so to get back to the ritual, your alarm is at 3.30, turn off the lights and sleep while holding your power object to get some rest. What would be your power object, Tim, just out of curiosity? A small toy or dare object from your childhood, what would that be? Jeez. I don't know if I have anything left from. Yeah, like, that's I don't remember. I actually have. Do you know what I have? That's quite cool. It's I don't know how it's managed to survive. I still have it. It's a little certificate that my dad got when I climbed Snowden for the first time. So oh, Snowden cool. is the yeah it's highest peak in Wales, Ireland, yeah. and England. I climbed it when I was five. So it's like a I climbed Snowden. It's mm -hmm. like you buy him from the get the gift shops over there. But I actually still have that. So that's probably one of them. Probably have that folded up or something. It's probably mine. Yeah, I'd probably choose some. Honestly, it would probably mean more for me to choose something from my kids. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that that uh, I that's... just remember, you know, playing with them with or something. That that would, that would probably mean more as, or at least as much to me, because I don't know if I have anything, honestly, from my childhood. I when I kind of left the farm, I kind of left the farm. Yeah, that was that. Like... Me. Would you be sentimental? Because you're a collector, right? I'm a collector. I'm sentimental yeah. as shit. Like that's part oh, yeah. of. Yeah, yeah. I have a few toys, but like little things. But they they wouldn't be the kind of thing you'd no. sleep with, you yeah. know, like or, or, or like deer that. heads, <laughs> skulls, <and> shit. <laughs> um. Yeah. I'm, I, like. Yeah. I'm. I'm absolutely sentimental about that kind of stuff. Uh, Same. But honestly, more more about my own kids. Like I. Yeah. Like I get like nostalgia will hit me a lot more for when my kids were little than when I was little. When I was little, it's like, well, that time's passed, you know? Yeah, I think that is a thing. It's probably a passing of the torch, right? Once you have the kids, it's like, yeah, like, you know, 
it's a it's a big change, you know what I mean? I think before you have kids, i.e. me, you're probably still egocentric a bit to when you were a kid. But as soon as you bring life into the world, right, you're like, I think that's the right way to be, is that their yeah. your memories with them are your kind of power and I what you would draw from it, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's cool. So um turn off the lights, hold your power object, get some rest. Now here comes show time. You get up at 3 30 a.m. with your alarm cock. You turn it off, but don't turn on the light. You have exactly three minutes, this is where it gets mad, to light your candle, grab your cell phone, and take your way to a dark room and sit in your throne. You should be seated by 3.33, which is a very hard word to say as an Irish person. Uh, if I was to say it as an Irish person, not a podcaster, I'd say 3.33. Um, uh, don't forget your power object. Check for potential red flags. If your cell phone didn't charge for whatever reason, abort the mission. If the alarm didn't go off at exactly 3.30, abort the mission. If you find the dark room door closed, now remember that you left it open, then you abort the mission. If the fan is turned off that you left on, you abort the mission. Hmm. Um, that's, I suppose, what I, I suppose what they're insinuating there is that there's some kind of trickster, yeah, stuff going on there where it's trying to sabotage what you're doing, right? So you don't want to be mucking around too much. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm kind of reading ahead there mm-hmm. to the, the the side note. If you have to abort the mission due to any of the above, leave the house with your loved one, go to a hotel or something. There's no need to run. You have time to grab a jacket and your keys and whatnot, but leave. After 6 a.m., the coast should be clear. That is interesting and mm. kind of scary. Mm. 6 a.m. sun up, I suppose. Is that what's, yeah, is that what's so. getting you, keeping you safe? Um, energy in houses, I mean, to be quite honest with you, I had heard stories. We, we had accounts obviously sent in, and I'm sure you have plenty as well, where people will tell you, this happened in my house, that happened in my house. But it was it was literally the interview with Brother Richard that was like, I was like, oh, that's he was talking about an exorcism. Mm-hmm. And um he was just telling the first hand account of kind of what happened in the house, and you're like, Oh, well, I just believe that that can happen now. Fair enough. Like, there you, there you go, Brother Richard. Thanks for that one. We then there's the other thing about doing this stuff in your own house that's like like if you a lot of paranormal investigators will not investigate their own house, and I totally get that. Mm-hmm. Totally get that. You have you ever done a Ouija board? Have I done it? Yeah, yeah, I've done it. yeah before. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know whether I want to play with that shit. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I was, <laughs> this was just being young and, and yeah, you know, yeah. You know, at this point, and I have people who are like, oh, I won't even have a Ouija board in my house. I'm like, what well, the, the board? It's, there's nothing yeah. wrong with the board. Nothing's gonna jump out of the board and get you. No. The, the the issue is if you're using it and you are contacting someone, you don't know what's on the other side. And mm-hmm. there are plenty of things out there that are that will absolutely lie. Will absolutely yeah. lie to you and, and pretend to be whatever you want them to be. You know, that I think this happens a lot with with uh, ghost encounters. I think mm-hmm. people go to like Gettysburg, for instance, they're like, Oh, I want to contact the ghost of the, you know, this general, or whatever. I think very unlikely you're doing that. I think there's mm-hmm. other stuff out there if you're if there's any reality to whatever you're contacting, I think there's something else out there that's going, oh, yeah, I'll be, I'll be the general. Sure. You know, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll, no problem. Yeah. Um, the ghosts that seem to be around, at least what Brother Richard was saying, is that, yeah, they're kind of like, um, they're not necessarily, at least if I'm understanding it correctly, they're not 100% evil or anything, but they're more just kind of on their way out. They're not really demonic in uh in their way but maybe they are a bit trickstery or something but then with the ouija board you're not actually know like what you're allegedly talking to if you're talking to anything at all but you don't actually know i actually have a cool story a friend of mine uh who i would trust and um believe 100 percent. but really weird story where he was kids again talking about you know doing ouija boards when you're young and there was a couple of them in a circle and the girl down and just passed out straight onto the Ouija board. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
just in the middle of it like and uh it was like i was like did you not think about you know more i said oh no we just thought she passed out and that was that and i was like uh you know like um, (laughs) yeah that that would that, that would spook the shit out of me like you know um because yeah i never did them i never i don't think i ever did any kind of weird rituals like where i'm kind of trying to tempt stuff uh, I do believe that my dad obviously is doing all the occult stuff, but I do believe that he would have put like, what would you call them, wards or something on yeah, like us as kids. Kind yeah, of. yeah, yeah. So maybe, maybe that's what's going on, you know. Um, but yeah. So let's see here. We get back to where we are. Um, right. I got, I went up a little bit there. So yeah, uh, turn on the lights. You're doing all that. You set your alarm. You wake up, you find, if you find any of the stuff disturbed, you abort the mission. Basically, mm-hmm. if all is going as planned, you can proceed and take your throne. Do not look directly at either of the two mirrors beside you. Do not let the candle go out. The fan is behind you. You must protect the candle with your body, which is standing in between, which there's a reason for. Um, it says, look straight ahead. At the darkness, not at the candle. Not at the mirrors, just straight ahead. Eagle-eyed readers surely noticed I didn't say during the setup which chair was queen and which was the fool. That's because it's your job to find out. And from their point of view, you were either their queen or their fool. Hence, three kings, right? Mm -hmm. So apparently everyone's kind of playing a game with each other, right? Which is uh, a bit unnerving. I won't spoil what happens next, but suffice to say... You won't be alone, and if you have questions, you'll get answers. Sometimes in the form of new questions, but hey, that's the story of humanity, eh? Just stay put and try not to move. Again, do not look directly at the mirrors, nor the candle. Just straight ahead, trust me. Don't chicken out either. You need to wait until 4.34. By 4.34, it's all over. It's okay to tremble a little bit, just try not to. Not because it affects the ritual or anything. It's just a pussy thing to do while in polite company. <laughs> now, there you go. So, a minute. So they're saying it lasts a minute, right? No, oh, an no, hour. 4.34, an hour and a minute. Okay, yeah. an hour and a minute. Okay, sorry. So, yeah, so okay. 60, 61 minutes, yeah. right? Yeah. Hmm. So it's worth looking into all these. The numerology side of it, there probably is something to it, right? It probably does mean something. Um, He says, "Um, did I mention not to let the candle go out? That's what the fan is for. You're protecting the candle with your body. But if your body were to suddenly be moved, then the fan will turn off the candle. That's backup number one. Your loved one is backup number two. So at 4.34, she has to come into the room and call your name. If that won't work, she has to call your cell phone. If that doesn't work, she has a glass of water in a bucket. She can't touch you, though. That's a newbie mistake. Backup number three is your item of power, whether it's a toy or locket or whatever. The object of strength you brought along for the ride. It will show you the way. So multiple backups. You got to be like a boy scout if you do these things. If you half-ass it, half-ass it all the way so that it won't work. Worst you can do is take it seriously enough for it to work and not seriously enough to be prepared for the consequences. (laughs) So that's basically the ritual, Tim. Uh, What do you think about it? Does it sound like anything familiar, maybe? And Uh... yeah. A little bit like maybe the psychomantium thing. I think there's a candle and two mirrors involved in that. Mm-hmm. But uh, I should have looked it up before we talked about it. That would have been smart uh, podcast prep, but I did not. Well, I have a phone here, so we're going to look it up now, Tim. Because we're, All right. we're, going, we're um, going to check it out. The Yeah, I, I, I think I would try this, but I would not try it in my own house. Hmm. Yeah, it's one of those ones. That, it does sound intriguing. Um, we do have uh, a user experience as well, and we also do have a follow up from the original author of the the idea. But the psychomantium, uh, just according to Wiki, um, a psychomantium is a small enclosed area set up with a comfortable chair, dim lighting, and a mirror angled so as to not reflect anything but darkness intended to communicate with spirits or the dead. Right. Okay. Um. It's popular, popularized by Raymond Moody. Oh, the nerd experience guy. Mm. He was the guy that came up with it. Um, he believed the psychomantium was useful as a tool to resolve grief. The chamber was kept darkened and illuminated only by a candle and a dim lit bulb. 
Subjects gaze into the reflected darkness, hoping to see and make contact with spirits of the dead. Moody compared the psychomantium to Greek necromantium, uh, and it was a form of scrying. Um, communicating with the dead, what's your thoughts on it? Do you think it can be achieved? Well, again, we're we're in this I'm not sure area, right? Because mm. I'm not sure that half the things that people think are, are ghosts are spirits of the dead. What about mediums? That's uh, the claim that they can talk to, to, yeah, to people. I mean, Do you think that's a possibility? I th I think they might be getting information from somewhere, but is, is it is it where they think mm. they're getting Including from themselves. They might just be able to intuit this stuff in some way. Mm -hmm. And and that's still cool. Like all like mm -hmm. like messing with ghost boxes and stuff. People are like, oh, you're doing that. You're influencing mm -hmm. the that okay. To me, that's still cool. Yeah. I still think it's like super cool. If I'm able to to influence whatever words come out of this box, super interesting to me. And I won't eliminate that as a possibility. So yeah, I just I'm just so I at that paranormal conference, I think I mentioned on the on the mini fuzz. Mm -hmm. Um you know, one of these guys was talking and he was saying, you know, oh, you need to, people need to dig down. You're, you're too surface level. And his whole thing was like, he was going to dress like he was, we were in Gettysburg. So he's going to dress like a civil war era person and only have civil war era things about him mm -hmm. and talk like a civil war era person. And this would resonate with the ghosts and he would have more experiences and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was saying how much activity they get by doing this. And I, you know, I did not, I let his talk go and I didn't raise my hand after his talk, but we happened to be in, have our tables together, our merch tables mm -hmm. together. And I said to him, I said, you're digging down, but you're digging a post hole. And mm -hmm. he got very offended. He's like, what do you mean? <laughs> I said, you're just digging down in one mm -hmm. area. You need to dig a foundation, not a post hole. I said, you made a big assumption that whatever you're talking to are the spirits of the dead. Like where, where is that? You, you people yeah. treat that as if it's a known. And I'm like, this is not a known. You're just assuming. You're mm -hmm. you want it to be the spirits of the dead. So that's said, that's a huge assumption. There's in my experience, there's plenty of things out there that will pretend to be anything you want. Mm -hmm. So my question is like, do I do I think it's possible to get information from beyond? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is it from the dead? I don't know. I have big questions about mm -hmm. that. Like, how do we know? How do we know? Yeah, I think um yeah, I was probably that with the medium side of things probably just kind of yeah a bit i suppose agnostic to where i'm like i don't know if someone shows me something good you know i'd entertain it and um there was one uh a tape recording actually there was one of the the mediums that i had heard actually allowed you to take home a tape recording of the session so that to me i suppose you're like Oh, that's pr maybe more credible just at a glance. I'm thinking if they're willing to like let you take home a recording, then they're confident in their abilities. They're confident in what they're doing. And yeah, th th they must back themselves quite well, right? Because there's no kind of, it's just a one on one thing where you can record it on tape. And this was, I'm talking, this was again probably around like uh, 2008, 2006, maybe. And uh, my cousin had died. He actually died really young. Uh, he was a teenager. And it was his mom who, who went to this medium. And, you know, they do say with the cold reading and stuff that, you know, if you're grieving fairly clearly, then maybe the mediums, it's a bit easier for them to extract stuff. I'd like to listen back to the tape again. But I remember, listen, I, I was smoking at the time. I was I was still a stoner. I remember I sat down and I smoked and I was listening back to this tape. I think it was about 15, 20 minutes long. It's really strange. Like it was pretty strange. Like some of the stuff that, cause I, I would have been still skeptical. I was probably even more skeptical then. And I was kind of going like, ah, there's no, like a lot of the stuff that she, she was pulling out and saying, I was like, Oh, I don't think she could have known this unless she's a really fucking good cold reader. Like I'm talking very, very good. Um, that stuff is strange. Yeah, we've 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 talked. Have you had any dealings with mediums or psychics or anything? We well, haven't we haven't done any. I, I went to I got invited to this haunted cemetery mm -hmm. and there was a psychic there and mm -hmm. he was I was not convinced. Let me say mm -hmm. this. I was yeah, kind of yeah. like, mm, I don't know about this guy, right? Yeah. 
and he's reading people's auras and all this stuff. Okay. And uh, he's kind of kind of called a bunch of us back to this sort of dark part of the cemetery. And he's he's doing these like aura readings on people. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm standing there and I'm like, I let me see what happens here. Mm -hmm. And I am literally like I'm trying to manifest a screaming psychic Bigfoot. Right. Oh, so nice. I am imagining a, a Bigfoot behind me screaming at this guy like angry. I'm trying to see like, like, will he pick up on this energy? Like a, just an angry like because I'm I'm kind of like irritated by him. Right. Uh -huh. I'm not believing him. Oh. And I'm and I'm like seriously, like heavily <laughs> concentrating on this. Like and he looks over at me and he says, your aura is huge. Oh, that's what he said to me. I was like, <laughs> now that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. That's really interesting because I was like, I don't believe anything yeah. about this guy. Yeah. You know? And then uh, I, I forget what else, how I found some like something really meaningful. Oh, yeah. I found like an acorn or something because mm -hmm. he, he said he said something like, oh, go over and and pick up that leaf and whatever under there is going to mean something to you. Right. Mm -hmm. And I picked up and it was an acorn. It's been years, so I might have, yeah. but essentially what happened then is I went inside, there was like, you know, a house of the cemetery to use the bathroom mm -hmm. and everybody else had left and right in the middle of the floor is an acorn. Oh, shit. In, in, in this house. And I was like, what is happening? Like, this yeah. was a really, really kind of neat thing that, uh, that went down with him. So I was kind of, you know, at first I was like, this guy's full of it. And then I was kind of like, I don't know. I yeah. don't know. Like maybe he was picking up on something. Yeah, I mean, look, there's a lot of interest and in, it's ma it's totally mad to me when you hear like, I don't mean mad in a sort of a, a way where I'm taking the piss. I mean, mad is in a way where my mind is blown when like a, a person as a medium or psychic <laughs> speaks with like utmost conviction. I'm like, whoa, like that they're actually backing their abilities and their belief in it. Um, And some of them, like I've heard some of them some of them now the alarm bells have been going like crazy when I hear them. Um, but and those ones would say like, "Oh yeah, I've I've, I've been like this since I was a kid." Mm -hmm. I'd actually be curious. This is another one that I'd be curious asking Brother Richard about. Was like, and I think there has been right. I think there has been cases. As a matter of fact, I think you might have done an episode about a case where there was like a boy who claimed he had kind of talked with um, maybe God or a religious figurehead or something, right? Yeah. Was yeah. that was that a bit of the, what was the name of that episode? Was it a two parter you did with Brother Richard, maybe? And it was uh, was it in Italy? Was there something in Italy, maybe? Am I, I can't remember the name of the episode now. There is one that you did with Richard, and I'm like, was there something in that, maybe? Can't remember. But anyway, basically, I wonder like the interpretation of like what a medium or a psychic says that they experience. Like, would a um, a religious like say would brother richard even look at it in a sense of like they could be potentially talking to god do you know what i mean mm. like like you'd wonder like is yeah. it adjacent to each other or is it more like no whatever they're doing is kind of different or well, interesting what, stuff what brother richard often says to me about this stuff and and i think it's really interesting is he says whatever all this stuff is it's using the same channels to get through so mm. whether whether you're talking about you know these saints having these mm. you know, miraculous experiences yeah that kind of thing yeah or these people having these like you know you know whatever uh, predictions with mm -hmm. john keel coming over the mm -hmm. phone call for the from the mouth man you know mm -hmm. it's like it's he's it's using the same channels to, to get through mm. so it it you know it certainly feels like the same same sort of stuff now whether it's the same coming from the same source is, a, is another. that's yeah that's very true as well um so we would probably give the ritual like a, a go, I suppose. Um, we do have here, Tim. If you want to read this, there's a a Reddit user's experience. Basically, um, yeah, this is just his post about doing the ritual and how he got on doing it. Now, before I go on any th further, let me introduce myself a little. This mm -hmm. is the Reddit person, not me. Mm -hmm. I'm an atheist. Have been since I was 13. Haven't gone to church since I was little. I don't take stock in any of this paranormal stuff either. I just consider it a fun avenue in which we can all spook ourselves. But ever since I tried this Three Kings thing, I'm not sure where I stand. Mm. I did this experiment at my girlfriend's house. She has a dance room right outside her room with a mirror wall, thankfully, positioned on the south wall, while the wall towards the north was blank. We spent the evening setting up the dance room, 
watched a nice movie afterwards, and then went to bed in a guest room downstairs. She was very clear about how she didn't want to be sleeping in the room next to the supernatural shit. <laughs> Makes sense. Now, after this point, I'll get it. It'll get a bit hard to believe for some of you, especially because none of you guys seem like the religious type. Blood magic, demons, cleansing rituals, tarot, etc. So, 3.30, I wake up to the sound of Weird Al playing polka music. <laughs> I figured it'd be best to go into this smiling. Me and my girl go upstairs, and she waits outside while I go in and take my seat, with the lit candle, of course. The room's, no long the room's longer than it is wide, and with the seat at the back, it was impossible to see the door through all the black. After a few minutes of nothing happening, I hear something from the darkness towards the door. It's a faint singing in a language I can't understand, and the blackness turns into a mass of shadows that look like people. They're all marching from the right to the left like they're on parade. And as they pass, I can't help but feel elated. After a couple of minutes of this going on, I noticed a second noise. From the chair to my right was the sound of someone writing something down. It was a scratchy sound too, like someone using one of those old quill pens. God, I love those things. I wanted to ask what it was writing down, but I was too afraid of the answer to go through with it especially when the room was full of moving shadows, even if they did look like they were rejoicing. The scribbling on my right ceased, and then a voice from the chair on my left spoke up. It said my name, and then started listing off every good deed I'd done in my life. Woo. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Big, small, valiant, accidental, all of them. Even ones I'd done when I was a little boy and forgotten about. And as the voice listed these things off, the writing on my right resumed. In case anyone's wondering why I've been gender neutral about the voice, it's because I couldn't tell what gender it was. Like every nanosecond, it was switching between male and female. The tone was somewhat soothing, but the constant switching still gave me something of a migraine by the time this was all over. Before we, yeah, before we, we go back to it there, that um, that's like a really prominent part of the NDEs, that um, the near that experience stuff is that like what a lot of people report is like, they turn into like basically what feels like a ball of energy. They don't feel their body anymore, but they also come across another kind of energy form. And that sort of um, evaluation of your life takes place. Mm. And the recounting of all your good deeds like that, that literally verbatim is in some of the, the near death experiences. Wow. So, the near death experience is actually, if you haven't read that book by Raymond Moody, that for me, like reading that, if even half of them are true, if even a quarter of them are true, you're like, oh, well, there, there's probably an afterlife, right? Do you know, yeah. like it's like yeah. it would turn you, it would definitely turn your beliefs a little bit for sure, because some of them are just like, you're like, what the fuck? This is absolutely nuts. Um, so it's definitely worth reading actually if you haven't after it got through listing all the good deeds it went over all the shameful things I've done in my past as well this is the part, I wish they would do this part first maybe yeah. <laughs> this would not be fun what? each one that went by made me feel pretty bad even small things like when I was five and stole a chocolate bar from my sister's Halloween candy the thing on my right was still keeping track or at least I assume that's what it was doing and I felt like I wanted to grab whatever it was writing and rip it, rip out the pages. It didn't though, because every other sense of my brain was telling me that that was a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. After it finished listing everything, it started speaking to me directly. Like, you know, how a guidance counselor in high school talks to someone, how to fix their grades or get to college. It kind of did that. It encouraged me to stay off drugs and alcohol, except when it's absolutely necessary for either. It told me that it didn't mind if I skipped church on Sundays, as long as I did more charity work. And it told me to call my parents more often. They've been worried sick about how I've been doing. Yeah. So my girlfriend called for me. Both voices said goodbye. The shadows and music faded away. And I heard the chair scrape against the wood floor. My girlfriend came in, asked how it was. And then we went back to bed. Didn't tell her exactly what happened because saying, I think God just told me to straighten up. <laughs> and the South could lead to bad things. Wow. So what the hell just happened? Did I talk to God? Am I nuts? Maybe it was a pair of spirits, demons, supernatural beings playing some sort of prank on me. I don't know what to believe after this. Also, should I have the house cleansed or <laughs> exercised, washed? I'm not sure if I should do that after every supernatural experience or just when something doesn't go right. Note, if anyone knows what language Baba Yetu is and what it means, 
that would be really helpful. It was part of what I could make out from the faint singing and the only part I could accurately phonetically pronounce, Baba Yetu. Oh, Baba Yetu are the first words of the Lord's prayer, prayer in Swahili. That's crazy, Anta. Yeah. Wow. So oh, that's really, really heavy. Mm. Based on just how many like Marian apparitions and how many of these these encounters with heavenly beings i've covered on the flowered path Mm -hmm. which which is on a break right now but uh, you know hopefully i will get back to it after i get the hermit's book published Mm -hmm. um i would question i would question just basically because the feelings during and afterwards weren't that good for this person it seems like Mm -hmm. like if he's asking if the house needs to be cleansed If he's like, if he's questioning, could it have been like some other supernatural being playing some trick on me? I think most of the people that have these heavenly encounters are elated and they're just like, just filled with like amazement, if not pure joy Mm -hmm. and things like that. So, um, I would, I would maybe question that a little bit. I'm not saying it Mm -hmm. couldn't have been that, but it, you know, just based on those other things, but it's, that's, I don't know. I, I, that would be interesting. Interesting encounter. I'm trying to think how I would react to that personally. You, you, would, you, would you change your life after an encounter like that? Perhaps, yeah. Like, I mean, it depends. Like, um, I think, uh, yeah, maybe if it's if it's something that we're just kind of spelling something out to you. Because, like, sometimes I feel like sometimes people can just say stuff in a way where you're like, yeah, that actually really makes sense. And you know what? You're probably right. Uh, we actually had it a little bit with Brother Richard where he was kind of saying, um, you know, that basically just at a sort of an entry level, again, I'm paraphrasing, but like any of that kind of stuff, like any of the the bad stuff, you're kind of letting in the badness a little bit. Like, do you know what I mean? So if you lead a path of, what was he saying? Basically a meaningful existence uh, where you're pursuing meaning and you're you know you're being compassionate and you're doing all that stuff when someone says that to you in that kind of way you're like oh yeah that makes total sense i should do more of that Mm -hmm. um so if it came through in an experience like this probably i mean i don't see why you know if it was something say maybe more sinister i don't think it would have anything to gain by encouraging you to do that do you know what i'm saying like it would probably be like I'm trying to think what angle it would go at if it was trying to do that. It would probably go down the path of like to make a joke of it. Probably like, oh, you look really sexy in that mirror, you know, keep, mm-hmm. you know, like take care of yourself. Go out and do this. It'd be very egocentric. You know what I mean? It'd be trying yeah. to encourage you to um, arse around, basically. It'd be trying to encourage you to go a certain way. Uh, I mean, well, I should step back and say some of these, some of these encounters, they do tell people to straighten up. Really? They, they, mm. Yes, they do. You know, some of these apparitions, um, they will tell people like you need you need to do better. Mm. People generally do after them, like you know. I would I, say so. Yeah, <laughs> I think <laughs> that that might do it. Yeah, I I think sometimes I don't know if you've ever had them, but I've had dreams sometimes that might change how you conduct yourself for a while. Whether it be I don't know whether it's just for like a week or a couple of days or something might happen in that dream or you might dream of someone. Um, I remember I dreamt of I have an auntie who died um relatively young, she's in her forties. Uh, she had cancer and stuff, but I had a dream where she was and when she was alive, I would say that she, she was very she was a nice person, but she had her issues, you know. Um. But in the dream that I had of her, she was just totally happy. Do you know what I mean? Just pure happiness. There was none of this. There was none of the. It was basically like seeing her at her happiness or her at her happiest um, the whole dream, you know, and she just felt it just felt like a really it was a good thing to experience, shall we say. So then after that, yeah, that that sticks with you. And even now when I'm retelling, I'm like, oh, yeah, that was nice. So, yeah, maybe maybe if you did have something you know, kind of telling you. Um, I, I, yeah. yeah, it would be hard to ignore it. I would mm. say that, you know, mm-hmm. it would be hard to ignore it. Have you found, would it be fair to say that you have become more religious in recent years? Yeah. 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 Um, has that helped you? 
Um, yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah. Yeah, it helped me sort of center myself. And um, it's, you know, a big part for me is, and, and I think people in general, without knowing it, I think sometimes they long for tradition. Mm -hmm. And I found myself kind of skipping from one thing to another. Um, even, and I, I again, I want to be careful about the way I talk about mm -hmm. this. Like, I learned Kohlhammer banjo, which is, a, you know, mostly associated with, with, southern appalachia mm -hmm. i'm not from there mm -hmm. but i learned it in a very traditional way from from another banjo player and and studied in west virginia and so forth mm -hmm. so i don't think there's anything wrong with that mm -hmm. but you know with me not be, not being born there and playing yeah, that yeah. kind of banjo there's nothing wrong with that and no. i think that's fine i'm i'm not talking about cultural appropriation but it was like i was looking to be part of a tradition i was looking you know and i did this again and again and mm -hmm. then at some point I realized like you've been part of a tradition. It was brother Richard that helped me really like he, he mm -hmm. didn't say this to me. It's just mm -hmm. in talking to him, I realized it's like, Oh wait, no, I grew up in a really strong tradition yeah. of, of Catholicism. And so for me, it, it was really seeking that, that tradition mm -hmm. and, and feeling that like, this is something I had to learn. This isn't something I had to, you know, change to be a part of and, mm -hmm. or anything. This is something that was, that I was born into literally. Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't respect it or realize it, you know, until it's at some point. And mm -hmm. I was like, Oh, wait a minute. I've been part of a, of a very strong tradition. So yeah, the um, religion, yes, but, but the tradition part has been huge for me. So, yeah. you know, I guess culture, religion, you know, whatever mm -hmm. weight you want to, you want to give to either of that, but yeah. And it's, it's helped me kind of, get my mind straight on some things i always say for me and i don't mm -hmm. recommend this for everybody yeah, for yeah. me mm -hmm. confession is better than therapy now i don't think that should be the case for everybody i've yeah. done both confession i feel is better for me yeah I, i'm not telling people not to go to therapy is a useful tool and i did it i did gain some very useful things from therapy so mm -hmm. i'm not saying it's it's bad or anything but just for me i think confession is better and and it's going to depend on each person's individual things. So individual personality and how they react to, you know, if you've different authorities and if you just yeah. don't like the religious structure, it's not for you. It's not going to be for you, but for, just for me personally, it works. So um, yeah, it's been, it's been an interesting sort of few years uh, walking back into that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think not what you said there about it sort of always been in the background is absolutely true. You can't get away from it in Ireland, really. It's just part of it. So I could absolutely see how it was something that you could kind of um, sort of find belonging in for sure. Uh, was, were you, was your family Catholic then originally? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So it's, it's, it's Catholicism, would that be rare in America? Would so I... in, in Maryland, so we hit Maryland where I grew oh, up. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right, right. Very Catholic. Yeah, but yeah. moving up here to Pennsylvania, it's like you're almost considered. It's almost considered like a cult here. Really? Like people, yeah. People are like, "What? What happens there?" Like we've definitely, oh, really? definitely had people come to the Catholic Church who were like Mennonites, say, and like they're like, "I just wanted to see what you guys were doing in here." Yeah, I was going to say, in the land of the Amish, the Catholic or the cults. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's bad. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely like there's. A, a town called McSherry's town mm -hmm. basically where they shoved all the Irish Catholics in, in York yeah. County. Like there's just this little town on this, you know, right, right on that, or it might be right into Adams County, it might yeah. straddle. But anyway, they just pushed all the Irish Catholic. That's where you go. You know, so <laughs> little like, like super Catholic enclave. I'm not sure how many Catholic churches they have in this one little town, but otherwise, you, you know, there's some Catholic churches around, but they're spread out far and wide. It's, it's really, different it's different because when i grew up it was the norm everybody was catholic in maryland yeah like well, in ireland it is the norm it's like literally just everyone was pretty much the majority is very much so catholic but um you'd get a kick out of all the churches there probably i'd imagine um you know some of them are probably older in america you know like in terms of the mo modern oh, I'm sure. mo modern structure so um even Wexford has two quite interesting churches, as well as a friary for the monks. There is a, fri a friary here in town too. Um, yeah, it is. It's, it's interesting. It's cool to see that though that that you got something out of it. The confession thing, 
I can see that making sense. I think I think it's probably the the way that you're approaching like uh, what would be the right word is not absolving yourself is it but it's it's the way you're approaching sort of lifting that weight off you i can see how confession would work versus holding myself accountable (laughs) exactly yeah Yeah. i can i can see that because i'm not when i do that i'm not hiding anything i'm just here it is this is what i did yeah yeah Yeah. and there's probably something nice about that too for sure um yeah man like basically look we'll get back to this this is really it's really interesting that the Lord's Prayer is actually part of it though in Swahili of all languages. Yeah. I don't know why it's in Swahili, but um, it's pretty weird. But basically, so the original user, I'll get his name again there. The guy that came up with this, um, where is he? His name? So Fable Forge. So basically, Fable Forge, he came back and he made another little post. So I I basically just summarized this. Um, but he he goes on to kind of talk about the origin of of this ritual and how it kind of came to be and how he kind of came to sort of um use it and all that stuff. But he was basically saying he was in a juvie detention center, and he was saying that at the time, which is this is kind of interesting because this is almost a folkloric thing. He was using his knowledge of the paranormal to survive. He was in in these prisons and he was like telling these folk tales and and maybe a bit of the religious side of things to the to the other inmates. Um so they refer to him as shaman or like shaman almost. Um he says he actually ended up in detention center for stabbing someone and that the, yeah. the conflict started over a cat, which is very Reddit like basically. They loved their cats on Reddit. But at the time he says that they were young, they were scared and they were obsessed with paranormal. He said, coming from a middle class background, they didn't fit in with the other troubled youths who had more serious issues like drug problems and abusive backgrounds. Their fascination with the supernatural became a way of coping and finding a place in the juvie's volatile social environment. So basically to protect themselves, this named Shaman, he began offering dream interpretations and advice on simple rituals like staring at reflections in the dark until it morphed or techniques for achieving lucid dreams, which we were talking about there in Minifuzz. Um, Initially, these services were meant to prevent them from being targeted by inmates, but they soon gave Shaman actually a bit of power and influence. And they became a leader of a small group called the Manos Brujas, which is witch hands, apparently. Brujas. Yeah, Brujas, um, who regularly performed occult rituals. While the group didn't entirely believe in the paranormal, the rituals became a form of social bonding and a way to exert control over the environment. That does make a lot of sense, actually. Mm -hmm. They invoke various spirits and folklore entities, such as La Llorona. Is there a way to say that, Tim? I think that's right. And El Charo Negro. One notable ritual involves a candlelit mirror exercise where participants participants would stare into mirrors sometimes seeing entities or figures so yeah during these rituals there was one boy named samuel this guy had a frightening experience in front of the mirror and he became transfixed he was unable to move they used water to extinguish a candle that he was holding and that broke his trance afterwards samuel's personality actually totally changed so he became more aggressive which was a shift that left a lasting impression on shaman himself this incident led to a critical lesson for the narrator only stable individuals should participate in these rituals. Troubled or emotionally vulnerable people were more susceptible to being harmed or to lose control. I would say this applies uh, to paranormal things if you're going to go out investigate and and to uh, psychedelics as well. Yeah, I think yeah, I think it'll apply to all all three of these things. Because sometimes, yeah, they can act like a mirror. I think both me and Em, and we've fairly openly talked about our prior drug use, and we were sort of late teens early 20s and we were both probably using for similar reasons we were we were um self-medicating i suppose Mm -hmm. rather than actually like recreationally doing it and it backfired on both of us you know uh, funnily enough when i met eamon the night i met eamon he smoked his last joint Mm -hmm. and i had my last drink so I didn't drink for three years and I smoked and Eamon drank <laughs> and then I gave up smoking. And so then, yeah, then I got back on the drink as well. So now we just bought drink. But um, 
yeah, no, it was one of those things where, you know, in hindsight, you look back and you're like, oh, I was just self-medicating. I was looking for something, wasn't in the right headspace. Oh, yeah. And if I think back and I think, geez, maybe if I had a touch of hallucinogenics, like that would have been very bad. Could have been. Yeah. I mean, I've had people who who I know who have had generally like good experiences on the mm. hallucinogen whose lives afterwards have been yeah. kind of wrecked. Yeah. Because they're just like, what do I do now? You know? Yeah. Um, Things can change, man. Too. The opposite, too. I've had people have like really just great experiences with it. You know, to anybody who gets uh, too obsessed with it, I, I would say look into, um, uh, yeah, who's the big acid acid guy? The one that Josh does impressions of. Um, <laughs> oh, Timothy I'm, Leary? No, no. no. The other, um, McKenna, Terrence McKenna. Oh, Terrence McKenna. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew it would come to me. Uh, look into the end of Terrence McKenna's life because something pretty frightening happened to him. Yeah, and uh, it's not talked about because people love to hold him up as this this guru of of psychedelics. Mm -hmm. But he had a very very bad trip, and uh, he stopped doing psychedelics towards the end of his life. At oh. the time where where you would think people would be way into doing more, you know, mm -hmm. to sort of help with that transition. Mm -hmm. And uh, he his whole personality changed, and he he didn't have a good time there at the end. So. I think these can be useful tools, absolutely, but I don't think they should be something that people should be doing constantly. Yeah, you know? I yeah, think, I think that can lead to to some issues as well. The dark side, basically. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he basically just talks about yeah the use of mirrors. He said the pra um they became a practice that they did every night in the in the center showers. Said um, participants often experienced unsettling visions. They heard voices, seen figures, the usual kind of thing that you'd expect. Um, they appeared to represent internal conflicts as important, I suppose, personified as two entities, which were commonly referred to as the queen and the fool. So this was kind of the origin of it. These figures would bicker, cajole, is that cajole, is that how you say that? Mm -hmm. And try to sway the person looking in the mirror. So the shaman theorized, uh, theorized that these entities were not external spirits, but rather different aspects of the participants' own psyches, which is quite interesting. The queen and the fool symbolized opposing viewpoints or unresolved inner conflicts that needed acknowledgement and resolution. Interesting. Well, like, so looking back on that other story, you have the good and the bad, right? Yeah. The listing of the good and the bad. Like, mm -hmm. like yeah, that's true. Like, show me, show me your worth, your what, you, what you've done to some of your life or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know how mine to be stacked now. <laughs> I got up to your man and he's telling you you're good in your bad deeds. You know what I mean? How long yeah. have you got? Kind of thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I mean, I yeah. Oof, I, don't, <laughs> I don't want to relive. No, no. Um, despite the eerie and sometimes dangerous nature of these rituals, the shaman learned his lessons and he impl implemented the fail safes that, that we listed earlier. Um, so yeah, basically, that's the origin, that's the ritual. Uh, what do we think of it, Tim? What do you think of it? Is it something that you're intrigued by? Would you give it a go? Like, I am, yeah, I, I am. I, I guess I would, but I would, like I said, I, I, don't, I wouldn't want to do it in my house. No. Um, I would do it at someone else's house or a neutral ground of some sort, not mm. because I'm necessarily afraid of, of activating anything or, but if it, if I did have a, a negative experience, then I, I just wouldn't want to associate it with where I have to live, you know? Yeah. No, I'd be the same. Likewise, you just don't need to, you don't need to invite that onto you. There's also just the element of, I don't know how you are that way, but I am where like you, uh, Sometimes if you get in a negative loop, you can sort of attribute it to something. And so if you do something like that and maybe a couple of negative things happen, that could easily snowball into you, like believing that oh, it yep. was that and yep. then it's the whole thing. Yep. And we're this talking about letting it in. Yeah. A big reason why I, I don't uh, let anyone do any sort of divination for me, mm -hmm. uh, telling the future, mm -hmm. that sort of thing, because... I don't want it to even subconsciously get in my head. Yeah. And then I do something in the future. Oh, 
I yeah. guess because of that. Like, so I just, I'm really people like, hey, do you want me to throw for you or whatever? Not if you're going to tell me anything of the future. Like, don't yeah. even, don't even tell me that if you want. Like, I've seen people who use it almost as like a a psychological device to read personality and so forth. Mm -hmm. I'm fine with that, no problem with that. But I don't want to know anything about the future because they might be wrong too. That or they might be interpreting through whatever source they're interpreting. They might be interpreting it wrong. You know, whatever yeah. they tell me. And then that's going to get in my subconscious. I just, I just, I don't even want it for that reason. Absolutely. I don't want to know any of that stuff back there. Just leave it to, leave it to face. I don't want to know what's around the corner. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, no, I think, yeah, I think that's a really interesting ritual. Um, I think maybe in future on the podcast, we'll probably do some more of that kind of stuff. There's definitely room for it. And by the way, for everyone listening right now, there is a load of accounts of this, by the way. So, like, there's lots of people saying, I did this ritual, this is what happened, that happened. Read one from a guy recently where he said kind of not much happened, but he still said he even got a little bit out of it. Even He was coming at it from more of a skeptical angle, but he was like, yeah, you know what? Eh, it wasn't for me, but I did get this and I did get a little bit of that. So, um, I think, yeah. I think even just the process of, so you're, the whole thing is is almost like liminality, right? You're disturbing mm -hmm. your your sleep pattern. You're going into a, a a dark room. People don't usually sit in dark rooms. You're do you know you're sort of out of your normal habits. You're doing this this ritual mm -hmm. that you don't normally do. So you're you're intentionally putting yourself in a liminal space. Mm -hmm. I think you've got a good chance of of something happening. Yeah, and it could be just like they said, it could be just accessing your inner self in some way. Mm -hmm. But like I said, I still think that's super cool. Like it's super interesting. Yeah, yeah. So it's a really cool exper experiment. Um, so what we'll do is we will leave it there. I think. Um, I think we've said all that we can on it. Uh, super interesting though. Um, oh, yeah. Nice little ritual. So what we will say though is, both for strange familiars listeners and monster fuzz listeners, if anyone does try it, don't try it because we recommended it. Try it because <laughs> you want to try it first off. But if you do, write in. Let us know how you got on. If yeah, you, it'd be interesting. Yes. Yeah, I think I think we we both like to hear um, cases. I'm sure Eamon would as well. If anyone does try it, Halloween's coming up soon. You know, we're getting into the the liminal time. Oh, Tim, yeah. have you got anything you'd like to say before we get out of here? Well, I want to thank you for having me here. No I love problem. Monster Fuzz. Happy to stand in for Eamon, mm -hmm. and uh, you can find me at strangefamiliars.com. It's an absolute pleasure, Tim. You're much like myself. I think we said that off air, but uh, we both like being around people who are like let's get it done let's go let's do episodes and it's cool to know that i can count on you when uh the other fellow's getting his turkey teeth um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah we'll leave it there guys thanks for listening over and out